Fluoride, the Aging Factor by Dr. John Yamianis. In this book, the late John Yamianis, Ph.D., explains the nuts and bolts involved with fluoride poisoning through the eyes of a biochemist. He also writes about the special interests and people behind the promotion of water fluoridation, who they are, how they operate, and why they scratch each other's back. John and I worked together on a major court case in Pittsburgh in 1978, and for several months my daughter Julie and I lived with the Yamianis family at the farm in Delaware, Ohio. Julie, by the way, was poisoned by fluoride as an infant and experienced a spontaneous fracture of her ankle as a child. The x-rays were identical to those published in case reports of skeletal fluorosis. Later, as a teenager, she lost her thyroid gland to cancer, also because of fluoride. I myself lived with arthritis, allergies, and gastrointestinal problems from age 7, almost died in anaphylactic shock at age 18, and had symptoms suggesting a series of small strokes by age 25. After an EEG showed clear evidence of poisoning by some unknown chemical, I changed my diet. Within a year, all of my health problems had disappeared. The twisted joints in my hands were permanent reminders, but my arthritis was gone and it stayed gone as long as I avoided fluoride as much as possible. Then, at age 54, I discovered the joys of fibromyalgia caused by fluoride air pollution. For three months, the pain was excruciating and relentless. Justice Flaherty was thoroughly convinced that water fluoridation was increasing the cancer death rates, but when he issued an injunction to stop it in Pennsylvania, he discovered the courts don't have jurisdiction because water fluoridation is considered a legitimate police power of the state. At about the same time, Michigan became the first state to repeal its mandatory water fluoridation law, giving citizens the right to vote rather than forcing it on them. This came about after I persuaded Governor Milliken's staff there was evidence that although the concentration of fluoride in the water supply hadn't changed, the concentration in food had increased dramatically. Two committees were appointed to look into the matter. And then Michigan's Toxic Substance Control Commission got involved and issued a warning. At one point, the director of the Michigan Department of Public Health gave radio and newspaper interviews supporting my point of view about runaway dosage, way back then. Then he quit his job and took another at the department. The story made headlines in several newspapers, and my husband stopped telling me I couldn't fight City Hall. I was lucky. The legislature was revising the health code, all they had to do was leave out the part about mandatory water fluoridation. The Michigan Dental Association, the American Dental Association, and numerous other individuals and groups did their best, but it wasn't enough. The people would decide. In August 1983, the big guns got together for a symposium at the University of Michigan. According to Dr. Yamianis, the stated purpose of the meeting was to discuss the status of organized opposition to fluoridation to analyze probable motives influencing the anti-fluoridation movement, to assess the need for a national fluoridation strategy, to develop political and legal strategies for the defense and promotion of fluoridation, and to evaluate past legal and political pro-fluoridation initiatives, focusing on the defeats as well as the victories. John also writes about Stephen Barrett of QuackWatch.com, who sued me for 100,000 U.S. dollars a few years ago and lost. I had challenged him to name just one fluoridation safety study capable of finding what it was supposed to be looking for, and then published the fact that he couldn't name one, although he claims there were hundreds.